Today, media is pivotal to the way that we receive information. We no longer have to rely on newspapers or huddle around a radio to listen to current events. We have access to hundreds, if not thousands, of sources to receive our information. The phone in your pocket is connected to the internet, which can connect you to minute-by-minute minute updates on everything happening around the world. So in the day of technology, how does a media company garner your attention and stay relevant when there's so many companies coming out? Today I will reveal to you the history of Vice Magazine and how a small alternative magazine from Canada has become one of the largest media companies in the world. I've personally been following the rise of Vice for over 10 years. I've been a subscriber to their magazine since early 2009, and I own several books on their history and how they started. And as an avid fan of their work, and someone who hopefully wants to work for them one day, I've connected with several people who know the owners and the company personally. Today I will discuss how Vice started, the early years of their founder, Suresh Ali, and the rise and fall of the company, and lastly, where they are today. So, that's exactly where we'll start. With a young man from Toronto named Suresh Ali. Suresh was born in Toronto, Canada, the son of Pakistani immigrants who moved to the country only a few years prior. He attended high school in the States and moved back to Canada to attend college. Unfortunately, he also brought with him a full-blown heroin addiction. So in 1994, he attended two treatment centers in hopes of getting better. He would attend NA meetings every single day after he finally got clean because he was afraid that he would relapse and go back to his old ways. At one of these meetings, he met a man who would later become his sponsor. And during an NPR podcast, Sarush explained that a sponsor helped him get a job at a bilingual magazine that was doing a French alternative that wanted to start another magazine that corresponded with it that was in English. He ended up getting the job, and he started a magazine called Voice of Montreal. With no experience and very little support, he would later meet Gavin McInnes. Gavin was a cartoonist and a very good writer. He would join the magazine and eventually become the assistant editor. Gavin's childhood friend was a man by the name of Shane Smith, who's right there. And Shane would join the magazine as well, and the original team for Vice Magazine was established. The three of them were still working for Voice of Montreal, but eventually they decided that they didn't want to work for anyone else and parted ways with the magazine. Suresh Ali, Shane Smith, and Gavin, Gavin McInnes then rented a loft down the street from their old office, and with $5,000 loans from each of their parents, they started Vice Magazine. <clears throat> According to New York Magazine, in 1998, Shane Smith told a reporter that a wealthy media mogul in Montreal had invested in Vice. He hadn't, but he was so intrigued by the prospect that he invited Vice over for a meeting, invested in the company, and encouraged him to move to New York. Unfortunately, the money from the media mogul stopped around 2002 when the dot-com bubble burst and they were completely broke. According to Suresh Ali, they had to sell and rebuy the company um, and eventually were left with a ton of debt and the task of rebuilding the company. But in 2006, everything changed for Vice. They pitched the DVD idea to MTV and according to the New York Times, Shane Smith describes the show as jackass meets 60 minutes. They called the DVD the Vice Guide to Travel. And now they were able to spread their message through a different medium, cameras. Uh, their DVD also appeared on the like, main page of CNN and it was considered top news, which basically created a whole new platform for them. From there, everything improved. Um, this was the beginning of a very positive turn for the magazine. Vice on HBO launched in uh, 2013 and marked the first time much of the broader public had heard of the company. Vice on HBO has been nominated for 11 Emmys and has won twice. And they even started a TV channel called Viceland, which was launched on February 29th of 2016. The channel is operating under the creative direction of Spike Jones. So, where is Vice now? They have a valuation of $5.7 billion. The TV channel that they started is broadcast in seven different countries, and according to SimilarWeb.com, Vice is currently the 10th most visited magazine website in the world, above Rolling Stone, Variety, The New Yorker, and even Time Magazine. So, the story of a down and out drug addict who had no direction in life and absolutely no experience as a journalist 
ends with him creating one of the largest media companies in the world, with a valuation of $5.7 and a global reach that he would have never dreamed of. The story of Vice Magazine represents hard work, determination, and most importantly, sticking to your guns. You can't argue the global reach that this magazine has had, and like I said in the beginning, we have so many options as far as media outlets and ways to receive our news and information. But I would like to show you a clip from Vice News. This is one of their most common avenues of presenting information right now. Um, the best way, I think, to show you a massive media company is to actually show you some of the media that has made them so famous. So right behind me are three illegal oil refineries. The police have been amassing a large presence of buses. There are about eight tons of water cannons. Well, these are the police who are going to have to fight the communists. The army is turned up in APC. Shane Smith and Shurus Alvey, who started the magazine when they're in 1994, when they're young, um, and down and out on their luck. They were both in that clip. They go into those regions and they perform that journalism. They go into the heart of those cities. And obviously it's really intense and they're not doing things that's like interviewing people or whatever, but they're interviewing people that obviously are going through traumatic events, international events that are dangerous and scary, and they're willing to put their life on the line to go and do something that they love. So the passion for the company and something that they started really young is still there. And they aren't sitting behind a desk in suits or anything. They're actually going out and doing something that they preach. So thank you. To whom? What did you think? that 
after the clip, after it's the dirty explanation, you didn't cut your paper at all. But during the your speech, sometimes you looked at your paper a lot. But it was like your speech was really flowing, and it didn't have any pauses or interruptions. And um, what you showed us was relevant. <coughs> the presentation was relevant to your speech, so that was great. Thank you. People like your evaluation there. Um, I thought the attention device and the identification of the topic at the beginning were very effective. I thought you had a very clear thesis statement. There's a good preview. Um, early on when you're telling the story, there's a lot of information that you're presenting. I don't know where it comes from. I assume it's probably their own website. And you mentioned that you have several publications that you own, books and uh, stories about uh, the uh, founding of the company and about the company itself. So. It probably would be helpful to get a little bit more of the citation there. It was much better in the second half of the speech. I heard more consistent citation of information in the second half of the speech. I don't doubt that there's validity to the information you have in the first half. I just think it's not being cited very clearly. Uh, but that's a, that's a minor issue, uh, and it wasn't something that I thought was a problem. Um, just something to work on in the future. The chronological historical development is all pretty straightforward and easy to follow organizationally. The thing that I thought was maybe missing, and up until the video clip, uh, I kept struggling. So what do they do? You know, what, you know the, the, the Vice News apparently is a, it, they're apparently not traditional, but they are covering news, and now it's international news, and it's maybe from a different perspective, or it's on the ground, or something like that. And I think that's kind of what I was looking for a little bit more of. What is it that makes this company different? How do they cover issues differently? What is it that they write about? Because when you sh when you showed me you know the the MTV program and the DVD thing, I'm going well. It sounds like it's like you said, Jackass uh, in 60 minutes. I'm going well. Okay. So what's that like? You know what what kinds of subjects are they covering? 60 Minutes covers esoteric subjects sometimes that are not necessarily newsworthy, and other times they cover things that are newsworthy, and Jackass makes it sound like they're, you kind of have an irreverent attitude about the whole thing and look at it from a different perspective. So I'm thinking this is a culture magazine that is humor-based and, you know, talk about something, and it's not until I get the video clip later on, I'm going, oh, no, it's completely different than that. So I felt a little bit like I was not getting, I was getting information about the company, but not much information about what it is that made the company interesting, important, or distinctive until the very end. Then I, then I got a little bit more of that, and I just felt like that should have started someplace earlier in the presentation. <coughs> the visuals, though, were nicely integrated into the speech. I, I, I see you figured out how to get the clip in there. That worked out nicely. So you had that uh, set. Excuse me. And then, uh, uh, for the most part, you're talking to us, which I really appreciate. You, you know your subject. You want to talk to us about it. You only have to look at the notes occasionally for a detailed piece of information and remind yourself what's coming up next. And that, that seems to suggest that you are pretty you know, immersed in the material and understand what you're talking about, which uh, gives us a better reason to listen to what you're saying. Um, I, I mentioned them, I, they, they weren't a deficit, uh, they didn't affect your grade or anything, but in the future, lose the gum and the hat. Okay, because <laughs> it will be a distraction in the future. All right, thank you. <laughs>